Good evening, El Paso. Welcome to Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera, where we raise the big questions and learn with you to how to have fun with them. My name is Jules Simon, and I'm a philosopher and teach philosophy, write philosophy, and practice philosophy at U the University of Texas at El Paso. And my name is Kim Diaz, and I teach philosophy at EPCC. And today we're privileged to have with us Brian Yothers, who is the Francis Spatz Leighton Endowed Distinguished Professor of English at the University of Texas, El Paso, and editor of Leviathan Studies. He's the author of Reading Abolition, The Critical Reception of Harry Peter Stowe and Frederick Douglass, as well as Sacred Uncertainty, Religious Difference, and the Shape of Melville's Career and Melville's Mirrors. He is finishing a, a term as chair of the Department of English at UTEP and is the principal investigator for the Humanities Collaborate at HEPCC UTEP, which is funded by the Mellon Foundation. In 2014, he received the University of Texas Regents Outstanding Teaching Award, and in 2022, received the Outstanding Faculty Achievement Award in UTEP's College of Liberal Arts. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here. And uh, I really love the idea of this show. Uh, participating in these kinds of dialogues, it seems to me, is what we should be about here. So oh, that's great. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. So our first question, we start off pretty general, but then we veer into the particular. <laughs> um, always kind of moving back and forth between the two as we do. So what, uh, give us some ideas about what you think literature and poetry is exactly. Okay, so that is, it's a big question and it's a vexed question because there are lots of answers to it and possibly none of them are entirely satisfactory, right? Uh, one idea is that literature and especially poetry are highly imaginative fields, right? And that's what distinguishes them. Of course, there are large sections of literature that are nonfictional, that are built around the essay, uh, even built around history. For example, Edward Gibbons's Rise and Decline of the Roman Empire uh, is a work of history. It's also considered to be a work of literature, right? So we have a wide range of different genres and approaches that define literature. And I think that you know, the, the most precise attempts that seem persuasive to me are those that focus on the idea that literature is particular, writing that's particularly self-aware as language, right? That's focused on how it means as well as what it means. Uh, and that the form of literature that's most strongly focused on the question of how language operates in a self-reflective way is poetry. Uh, I also really like some definitions of poetry in particular that are focused on the effects that it has on its reader as well as what it is in itself. So Emily Dickinson rather famously says uh, that when she feels as if she's cold and no fire will warm her, that means that what she's been reading is poetry. When she feels as if the top of her head has been taken off, that means that what she's been reading is poetry. Uh, and it seems to me that that's right in an important way, as nonspecific as it is, because the idea is that literature and poetry are forms of writing that somehow engage us in the act of creation and that in some way change us and rattle us and shake us in some kind of really important way. Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned before we started that we were both literature majors as, as, as undergraduates. And so I studied a good bit of poetry and, uh, and literature. Uh, and in fact, my dissertation was uh, built around um, a Midrashic interpretation of the Song of Songs, ah. right? So by Franz Rosenzweig. Um, and it seems to me that I, I, I just resonate with poetry in some ways much differently than I do with literature. So literature has this kind of narrative effect to it for me, and um, I can sink into it all by myself, but poetry has this almost outspokenness 
feel to it, and my engagement with it is, is, uh, you know, it, it feels more dialogical. It feels like I'm in more in a dialogue, because it almost seems as though every poem calls out to be read out loud or something or read together. Yeah, that's a very interesting point, and and I think especially so because. You know, there have been some influential theorists of literary studies who have taken an opposite tack, right? Mikhail Bakhtin, for example, makes the argument that what's really great about the novel is that it can incorporate so many voices, right? And he says, well, poetry doesn't necessarily do that as well as fiction does. But I think that the point that you're making is what sometimes gets missed out on in those accounts, right? That the other voices that poetry invites uh, can often be our own voices, right? That we're being invited into the dialogue. And so it's not so much a matter of uh, sitting outside a theater where we're looking at the dialogue going on, as is the case uh, with many really rich and fascinating novels, but we're actually being invited into uh, a kind of dialogue with the language of the poetry, and even into a dialogue with ourselves, right? Uh, there's a very famous poem by Willem, William Butler Yeats, for example, called Dialogue of Self and Soul. And it goes back to an earlier tradition where you have uh, dialogues between the spirit and the flesh, for example, uh, within a uh, poetic tradition shaped oh, by right. Christianity. So, so yeah, I, I think that that's uh, I, I think that that's something that I find deeply engaging about poetry. That I feel like there's always a kind of invitation there that I really relish. Yeah, and and even in uh, dramatic writing, you know, like Shakespeare, um, you get this very poetic element. Right, so we get like we're drawn in by the poetry of Shakespeare, but there's a narrative going on, yeah. right? Just like there is in a novel or or something like that. So that's another interesting phenomenon that's quite distinct from, I think, that of the two. Uh, yeah, I I mean I think that that's a useful point, and one of the things that strikes me about that in relation to some of my own interests uh, is that. For a long time, there was a way of teaching poetry in American universities in particular that associated poetry with lyric poetry, right? So odes, sonnets, things that tended to be very much about internal reflection uh, and the external events that would spark them would often be fairly modest, right? So think of Ode to a Nightingale, for example. Mm -hmm. The poet hears a nightingale singing. Uh, but of course, poetry has many modes beyond the lyric, and so many poems do tell stories uh, in an extended sort of way, right? I mean, in the English language, the very famous example is Paradise Lost, right? Where you have uh, the story of humanity's fall uh, and Milton's attempt to justify the ways of God to men, right? As he puts it. Uh, some of my own work, uh, the, uh, the longest poem in American literature, and this is not necessarily very well known, uh, but the longest poem in American literature was written by Herman Melville. It's 18,000 lines long. It's called Clarel, a Poem and Pilgrimage in the Holy Land. When it came out in 1876, it sold literally tens of copies. Um, that may actually be an, obs an exaggeration upward. Uh, it was <laughs> not, uh, Melville himself said it was eminently adapted for unpopularity. But it gives a kind of narrative of the experience of a group of travelers who have come from the United States and from Europe and from Mexico uh, and uh, from uh, other portions of the Near East than Ottoman Palestine. And they're all meeting around Jerusalem and they're in conversation with each other, so it takes on a kind of dramatic form. Uh, they're having experiences that include, at one point, uh, a camel eating a missionary's tracts. Uh, so it also has a narrative element. And then there are these bursts of lyricism here and there. And so it shows the range of things that poetry can try to do. And I would say it's a pretty good poem, all 18,000 lines of it. 
uh, even though it hasn't necessarily achieved the kind of audience that Shakespeare's sonnets or Paradise Lost has. And, and so that's another of the exciting things for me about studying literature, that there's always an opportunity to find something that other people haven't necessarily delved into as much and to engage with it more deeply. And then when you meet other people who are working with things like Clara, for example, uh, you really feel a kind of kinship because there aren't that many of you out there. Uh, but you've encountered this text that's meant something to you that hasn't necessarily been uh, a part of wider conversations in quite the way that Billy Budd or Moby Dick, for example, uh, to, qu to mention two of Melville's most famous works have. Yeah. I, so you've mentioned um, a number of things about the good things about reading poetry or reading literature. Is there anything else that, it, that stands out to you that are awesome things why we might want to be continue to read literature on poetry? So I think that there's been a lot of language in recent years about immersive experiences, right? Uh, and I think that one of the most immersive experiences that I have is when I really lose myself uh, in a really good novel or in a really good poem or a uh, book of poetry or series sonnet cycle or something like that. Uh, I, one of the things that sometimes uh, those near and dear to me complain about uh, is that I can practically have someone right next to me uh, asking me a question and I can be so totally absorbed in the book that I'm reading that I have no idea that anything's happening uh, outside of that. And I, and I think that that's an amazing experience, right? That wherever you are, uh, whatever you're doing, whatever surrounds you, however noisy it might be, you know, you can be in this condition of solitude, right? Uh, where you're meeting this one other person uh, or this group of other people, this uh, another mind uh, through the written word, and you're able to be completely engrossed in it. I think there's tremendous pleasure that comes with that sort of experience. So that's something I really value. The other thing is that one thing that I find, whether I'm reading a book for the first time or the tenth time, it always challenges, or as in the case of Moby Dick, maybe for the hundredth time, uh, it always challenges my preconceptions, right? There's always a sense in which I come to an experience of reading something thinking that I know what I'm going to take away from it, but it's always something a little bit different. Maybe that's especially true when it's a totally new book, but it can be true when it's something that I've almost memorized, you know? I, I still end up finding new experiences. And so I think that that sort of variety of experience is a really exciting part of reading literary texts. Thinking about your, your comments just now about solitude and immersing yourself in, in a novel, right? I noticed that one of the themes that, that you deal with in your own writing is this tension between the style, that perhaps a dialectical tension between uh, solitude and individuality and uh, sociality, you know, the kind of social context that we're engaged in. And it seems like literature and poetry. Um, philosophy as well, you know, are, are, are uh, really um, geared towards um, addressing that dialectic between solitude and sociality. Because in both cases, the novelist or the poet or the philosopher has to spend a lot of time with themselves, you know, in, in thinking about and writing and just being with one's craft, right? But then there's a the matter of engaging and having social relevance for the writing. And surely we don't want, when we write something, we, d we don't want it to be, you know, read by just tens of people <laughs> <laughs> well, or to drop dead from the press, like Hume said of, you know, it's a set of Hume's book uh, when he publishes. We don't write for others. Sometimes we do write for ourselves, though. Right. There is the writing mm -hmm. for oneself, and there's a large part of that going on, the self-examination, the self-reflection, and honing my own craft and my own writing, right? 
So there is that dimension of it. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe you could. You, you've done some work on that with yeah. Moby Dick as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the interesting. Attention. Yeah, I, I think the interesting thing is that on the one hand, you have an activity that can feel deeply solitary, right? Uh, if you're reading, uh, unless you're reading aloud, uh, which of course can be a very sociable activity. For example, if you're uh, participating in a Moby Dick marathon where people are reading out chapter by chapter, mm -hmm. that can be very sociable. But a lot of the time when we're reading, we're reading individually, and a lot of times when we're writing, it's a kind of struggle with uh, the blank page, right? To get our thoughts out. And in many ways, um, our, our first audience is ourselves, right? That we're wanting to make sure that we're writing something that in some way satisfies our need to engage with the questions that we feel are most pressing to us. And then the question of what happens with those words as they move out into the world uh, can have a number of different um, valences. So on the one hand, I think there's a general desire to make sure that as many people as possible, uh, at least who will be interested in our work and understand it or engaged with it. But there's also a sense in which we tend to desire a deep level of engagement, right? So I use Herman Melville as an example a lot because of the fact that I spend a lot of time on Herman Melville and I tend to use other 19th century figures like Emily Dickinson, Frederick Douglass, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne a lot uh, because I also uh, engage deeply with them. But so, so Herman Melville, uh, Moby Dick was actually his sixth novel. He writes five novels before it. Uh, the first two of which are quite popular. The first one, Type P, is very popular, and it gets him a reputation as, quote, the man who lived among cannibals, uh, which was a rep uh, reputation he didn't entirely love, but also recognized was paying the bills early in his career. Uh, and then he writes uh, a novel where he's attempting to be very philosophical and is very ambitious called Marty, that really kind of falls apart. It becomes this huge allegory uh, that not very many people buy. Then he writes a couple of books, Redburn and White Jacket, that are based on his experience at sea that he says are a little bit like cutting wood for money because he just, he needs to get paid. He's just gotten married. He's a new father. Uh, by the time he's working on Moby Dick and his wife Elizabeth is expecting uh, their second son. And so Moby Dick is the work that for him, he wants to make sure brings together both the desire to communicate with a wide audience and the desire to investigate all of the philosophical and religious and intellectual concerns that are most central for him. And he finds success in that the one person who he believes is most central to his audience reads and understands his book. So whenever I start teaching Moby Dick, I always start with his letter from November the 14th 1851 to Nathaniel Hawthorne mm. uh, because Melville had a tremendous admiration for Hawthorne, even love for Hawthorne. Uh, he inscribes Moby Dick to, uh, to Hawthorne, quote, in token of my admiration for his genius. And when Hawthorne reads a copy of Moby Dick and responds in some way that indicates that he understands it. We don't know in what way because Hawthorne's letter to Melville doesn't survive. Melville's letter to Hawthorne does. Uh, but he proclaims regarding that ineffable socialities are in me. Mm. And he says, I could sit down with you and all the gods in old Rome's pantheon. Uh, he also says, uh, using Christian religious imagery, uh, that uh, he and Hawthorne are broken up like the bread at the supper. Uh, and he refers to an infinite fraternity of feeling. So you have this sense of an author as a profound sense of sociable connection, in this case to an audience of a single person, right? Mm 
a lot of what follows uh, that initial jubilation when he writes to Hawthorne involves disappointment, right? Moby Dick, the conventional narrative is that Moby Dick gets terrible reviews. It's not quite true. It gets some pretty good reviews, some pretty bad reviews, some reviews in between. What it doesn't do is catch fire, which is what he needs, right? And so it never sells in the way he needs it to. And it's you know something that ultimately he experiences as a fairly crushing disappointment. But there's also a sense in which having connected with this one ideal audience has actually been an incredibly social event for him, right? Uh, so I think that that's part of the story as well, that uh, there des there's a desire to communicate broadly with audiences. There's also a desire to communicate deeply. And the other thing about the sociality of reading and writing is that you're always part of a dialogue with the writers you're reading and with the writers you're referring to. One of the great things about Moby Dick is that you can read through and page by page by page out of you know, 420 pages in the Norton Critical Edition or 640 pages in some editions or 505 pages in some editions. Whatever the, whatever the pagination is, you're encountering all of these connections with other books on virtually every page. And so there's a kind of dialogue throughout the work with other writers. And, and of course, the idea that you mentioned with regard to poetry also comes into play here. Uh, because the nervous, lofty language that Melville uses, that he describes Captain Ahab as using in Moby Dick, has a kind of poetic quality. It engages us on the level of lyric or narrative or dramatic poetry, even though on a page it looks like prose because the sentences wrap around. So at any rate, that's something that I find to be really important relative to Melville's understanding of sociality. The other author I really think is interesting uh, among the ones that I'm obsessed with when it comes to questions of sociability is Emily Dickinson. Because of course the conventional view of Emily Dickinson, uh, and it's not without foundation, uh, is that Dickinson is up alone in her bedroom writing poems. That's my view of her. Um, and that <laughs> is, that's in large part true. Yeah. Uh, it's also the case that Dickinson is out in her garden and is very much engaged with the natural world on an individual level. But more than that, she's also writing letters constantly. And many of her letters contain poems or take the form of poems. And many of her letters that don't actually take the form of poems in terms of being written out in verse contain some of her most poetic language. Right? So what I quoted earlier about feeling like the top of her head was taken off, that's from a letter. Uh, in another letter she says, uh, talking about the act of letter writing itself, a letter feels to me like immortality, the mind alone without its corporeal friend. And so this idea that letters actually give her a way of engaging directly with the minds of others is at once very poetic, despite the fact that it's taking the form of prose in that letter, but it really expresses the way in which for this very solitary writer in some ways, she's also writing so much of her work in relation to other people. Um, and I'll mention in passing just one of the greatest lines from her letters uh, and one that I always like to quote to my students, which is that she refers to herself at one point in her letter to Thomas Wentworth Higginson, whom she seeks out as a mentor uh, with variable results. She refers to herself as the only kangaroo among the beauty. And I think that the only kangaroo among the beauty is one of my favorite lines ever, anywhere. And it's, it shows the way in which her letters are in many cases every bit uh, as poetically rich as her verse. Uh, so, so Dickinson is a figure who is at once deeply private and profoundly engaged with an audience of her own choosing. This may be going down a rabbit hole, but, <laughs> but um, since you just spent so much time on letters, <laughs> um, 
Do you think with the rise of the, the emergence of technology over the last several decades and um, you know the preponderance of social media and Facebook and email that and the that delete button <laughs> the, idea, the art of letter writing has almost diminished to disappearance or something like that I, I, people don't write letters anymore I, I remember when I was really young I would go away to my grandparents farm and my grandmother who hadn't even graduated from high school at this point would take me and my cousins for a summer and and uh, every night we'd have to write a letter <laughs> to one of our relatives or a friend and you don't get that same sort of sense for the importance of letter writing now it's just you know you know likes and yeah <laughs> you know facebook messaging and uh, all this this which is or not texting. letter writing or texting right yeah it's something that's worrisome right i mean even in relation to our records of history right so much of what we know about authors but also about major actors on the world scene comes from letters, right? And to some degree, the need to document means that in political contacts, for example, things will still have to be preserved, even in an electronic format. But you mentioned the delete button, Kim, right? I mean, one of the problems is that um, it's, it's easy enough to burn a pile of letters. It's even easier to just hit delete, right? And so we run risks of not being able to maintain the archives, right, uh, of someone's thoughts if their email account, for example, gets erased uh, and we're not able to actually have access to things that might have been preserved. Now, this has always been a problem. I mean, Henry James, for example, brother of William James, who I know uh, means a great deal to you in terms of your work, Kim. Henry James, uh, burned a lot of papers, right? And he even has a story called the Aspirin Papers that is about this phenomenon. Part of the reason why we don't have uh, all of the material that we'd like to have about Melville uh, is that he received private letters that he didn't preserve, right? So there's always been the possibility that things aren't preserved, but it becomes intensified. And um, I mean, one thing about the way a letter functions is that you've got a limited amount of paper. You want to make sure that you use it all up so that you're able to uh, make the most of your opportunity to share your thoughts with someone else because you won't be able to do it again five seconds later after you drop something in the mail. Uh, you're necessarily constrained to saying a lot of stuff at once, whereas texts, you can convey a lot through texts, but they're coming in very small, discrete bursts of information that don't necessarily require the amount of crafting that a letter does. And yeah, my sense is that there's something potentially lost there. I mean, I wonder if a text is like immortality in quite the way that a letter was for Emily Dickinson. I also suspect that texts have their own kind of poetry, sometimes at least, right? Uh, where someone who is verbally adroit and is interested in conveying a lot is able to do that. And I think that there have been novels, for example, in recent years that have tried to pick up the epistolary model mode, the novel that's written in letters, making use of texts and posts and tweets uh, as well as more traditional forms. So I think there will be ways of adapting to it, but the fact that there's a means of adapting to it doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be losses. And, and I have to say that the emails I take the most pleasure in sending and receiving are the ones that look least like emails and most like letters. Uh, but in some ways, they don't look like emails when they take that more uh, formalized uh, sort of form, so. I would like to mention that um, Jules's grandma did not have her high school diploma at the time when he was a young boy, 
but she was, I think, in her 60s when, yeah, when, when she got, she her, got her GED. She wow. got her GED. Isn't that awesome? I think that's yeah. great. You oh, know? that's wonderful. I think so, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is that, but then, you know, so she uh, didn't have her degree, but, of course, she valued writing and education and made her grandkids write letters. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you, for you, what is the most awesome thing about writing? For you as a writer, what do you think, you know, as opposed to, I'm thinking, as you're telling us about this new poetic of, of texting, I'm thinking YOLO, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know? But what would you say, what do you enjoy the most about writing? Well, and this is why I think that forms that are longer than tweets or texts are desirable in many cases. I, I mean, I think that the possibility of learning as one's writing, right? Writing as a means of exploration, writing as a means of self-knowledge, writing as a means of uh, communication, even as it's also looking inwards, is what really draws me, right? Because um, I, I think sometimes, and this is a problem students have sometimes when they're first starting, they think that the uh, way that writing works is that you come up with a brilliant idea before you start writing, and then you find words for it, right? Whereas, in fact, we're actually working with words all the way, right? We're always uh, having to express our thoughts in some way in words. And so the actual process of getting things out on paper or on a screen uh, enables us to engage in the practice of thinking, right? Engages, allows us to be able to sort out what we really believe or what we've really learned or what we really have to share. So I think the idea that writing is always in process is tremendously attractive to me. And this actually takes us to Billy Budd, which we were talking about a bit before uh, we started our formal conversation. So Billy Budd was written over 30 years after Melville published Moby Dick. He starts writing it in the late 1880s, and when he dies of an enlarged heart in 1891, he has mostly finished it, but not entirely. So he has stretches that are more or less fair copy. He has stretches that are still, you know, uh, scribbled over and crossed out. And in fact, even something as basic as the question of what was the name of the ship in Billy Budd has two answers, and both of them are plausibly correct. Uh, he refers to the ship as the indomitable most frequently, but in the portions he wrote later, he refers to it as the bellipotent. So you can actually pick up copies of Billy Budd today that refer to the ship by either of the two names. Um, although the bellipotent since the 1960s has become the dominant name because uh, there was an influential edition of Billy Budd uh, edited by Harrison Hayford and Merton Seals that was published at that time. Uh, that kind of established that we're going with the bellipotent. Everyone sort of goes with that uh, afterwards. And, and there are good reasons to do this. But this also suggests the way that writing is in flux, right? You've got this guy who, towards the end of his life, uh, is working on this story, uh, a story, by the way, that grows out of a poem. He writes the poem at the end of Billy Budd, Billy and the Darbies first. He starts writing a head note, and he gets really interested in the head note. And the head note turns into the 90-page novella that we know as Billy Budd. But if you look at uh, the manuscript pages from Billy Budd, and this is one of the nice things about our technology today, you can actually go to a site called the Melville Electronic Library that's edited by John Bryant and Wynne Kelly, and you can actually look at the manuscript pages from Billy Budd, and you can see the way in which he's 
you know, crossing out lines. He's drawing brackets so that he can write in insertions in his text. And you see the way in which writing this novel is not just something that flowed out of Melville's beautiful mind in his last years, but rather something where he's really engaged in struggling to figure out what it is he means to say. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a big part of the pleasure of writing. And I think that once you have something that is sufficiently done that you're ready to publish it, then there's something of the feeling that Melville expressed in that letter to Hawthorne, which he describes as uh, being content. Uh, and he says uh, that uh, there's no hope in it, there's no fear, uh, just a sense of contentment, yet without any licentious inclination. Uh, and that's the way he kind of sums up this moment of calmness that he experiences once he's arrived at the pages that he wants to go out into the world to represent him. I have another question. What would you say is, you know, our, our show is Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera, La Frontera being a border between something and something else, right? So, so much of, so, well, especially like Melville, he's so philosophical. And amongst philosophers, we were talking, James writes so well. He writes unlike philosophers. So what would you say is that border, that frontera between philosophy and literature? Okay, so it's an interesting question because it's been a bit of a contested and in some cases tightly guarded border, right? Uh, to extend the metaphor a bit further. I mean, we have, going back to Plato, the idea that there's uh, a kind of tension or even war between philosophy and poetry and that perhaps the poets don't have a place in the Republic. Uh, in Plato's ideal republic. On the other hand, one of the most commonly noted things about Plato uh, is that he is himself a poet, right? Uh, and that, um, you know, his use of metaphor, uh, in general, uh, Plato is a source of poetry as well as philosophy. And, and I think that that kind of tension runs its way through the history of literature and philosophy in relation to each other. Um, so, for example, uh, one of the problematic things about literature from the point of view of many philosophers is that literature seems to be about making things up and philosophy seems to be about truth, right? Uh, and literature thus has insufficient respect for the truth. Um, many authors uh, of literary texts, though, have actually embraced the idea of uh, writing as a quest for the truth, right? So um, to take us back to Melville and Hawthorne, which clearly is a subject I like thinking about a great deal, Melville writes a review of Hawthorne called Hawthorne and His Mosses that contains a lot of things that aren't true. Uh, like, for example, the idea that the author of this review is a Virginian. Melville is not a Virginian, never lived in Virginia. Uh, he's from New York City. He lives in Massachusetts. Uh, while he's writing this review and while he's writing Moby Dick, um, but Melville's really engaged with the question of how literature can lead us towards the truth. He refers at one point to Shakespeare and he says that Shakespeare is important because he's a master of what Melville called the great art of telling the truth. So the idea is that imagination is required in order to tell the truth. Uh, and that in some cases you may not be able to get at the truth without some sort of imaginative leap. Uh, he's also very interested in uh, the art of telling the truth in relation to Shakespeare because he acknowledges that in some contexts, say Elizabethan England, where there are a lot of secret police uh, taking a look at what you're writing on every occasion, uh, you may not be able to tell the truth entirely directly. Right? 
and so that in some cases it's necessary to find ways of telling the truth that might, as Melville puts it when he's writing about Hawthorne's work, deceive, egregiously deceive the superficial skimmer of pages, right? So you have to find the truth and tell the truth through your writing, but you also have to write the truth in a way that um, enables it to get past the censors, right? And so that's an idea that's very important for Malville, that there's a kind of profoundly persuasive dimension to how we uh, communicate, and that in some cases uh, that communication might need to involve some dissembling. Um, and, I, and I think that you know James is an interesting example of someone who is both profoundly reflective and, of course, redefines what truth means in some ways, right? As a pragmatist, uh, he's looking for ways in which truth does things, not just ways in which truth kind of exists as an abstraction. But part of what makes William James so fun to read is that he's always finding ways to convey that vision that are rich with metaphor, that uh, are punchy and engaging in their language. The line from The Will to Believe that I think you referenced in our mm -hmm. conversation where uh, William James um, says, and uh, I can't quote the first part uh, verbatim, but he talks about the ways in which everything that we believe or that we think is important in the world may actually be an illusion, right? But he concludes by saying, but it feels like a real fight. And there's something very direct and powerful about the fact that he can deal with some fairly abstract questions about knowledge and then bring them down to our own sense of striving, right? And our own sense of meaning in the world. Uh, so yeah, I think that literature and philosophy end up being deeply in dialogue with each other. And, and the 19th century is a really good time for that, right? And in continental philosophy, which I know is uh, your specialty, Jules, I mean, figures like Nietzsche and Kierkegaard uh, are profoundly literary writers who are central to philosophy. And writers like Melville, Dostoevsky, Robert Browning uh, in a British context, all of them have intense philosophical investments as well. Oh yeah, and in Dostoevsky's case, I, I was just reading a review of Notes from Underground, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and the fascinating sort of uh, interweaving that Dostoevsky goes through to address the kinds of, you know, skepticism that gets, um, that's been circulating in his day, right? Uh, intellectual skepticism. You know, he, he, he takes this perspective of this, you know, this mole from underground <laughs> and, uh, and, and says, from my perch, for I can be observing things and this is how they look to me. You know, this is how they look. And then and, and the reader has to make some sort of judgment, right? But the, you know, the author has to guide us along, you know, and guide us along and, and take us on a trip, so to speak. And I, I think that um, in a book as massive as Moby Dick, just to come back to the kind of elephant or whale in the room, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's a long trip. And uh, there's many different kinds of characters and different pathways that we can take. Um, and so I guess this is leading up to a question that I want to ask you is, is how did you, I mean, was it in your, what you read that, that when you were younger that led you to engage with literature the way you did and pick up philosoph the philosophy books you did or, um, you know, what, what's your, what, what was your reading background? Was it a reading background or yeah, something so like that? So my parents were both uh, school teachers. Um, uh, unfortunately, they were school teachers at the kind of schools that believe that you get paid in the afterlife. Uh, so, so it meant that, uh, for example, when I was a kid, our TV broke when 
Uh, I was about three, and we didn't get to replace it till I was seven, uh, because you know you actually have to have money to replace TVs. Um, but that was in some ways a very good thing <laughs> because it meant that. Uh, I was investing an awful lot in reading when I was a child, even when I was very small. And because my parents were both school teachers, they were both very committed to the idea that reading was, you know, one of the best things that a, that a child could be doing. Um, my mother's relationship with reading was particularly interesting. So she uh, grew up in an old order Mennonite family modern enough that they drove cars, uh, conservative enough that they painted their uh, bumpers black because chrome is the jewelry of a car and they didn't believe in that sort of worldly flashy display. What they also didn't believe in was higher education. Uh, and so my mom, when she was growing up, she loved to read and there were enough books around that she was able to do it but she would have to hide away <laughs> in order to be able to read. So oh, reading wow. was this kind of um, almost, um, uh, almost transgressive behavior that she right. would engage in, that she would hide in a closet and read her books when she should be doing uh, something useful like you know, milking the cows or churning the butter or something like this because she lived on a dairy farm. So she actually dropped out of high school per her family's preference. Uh, and then several years later, in her early 20s, went back for her GED. Uh, and so on her side of the family, I believe in the immediate line, I was the first one to graduate high school as opposed to getting a GED. So she got a GED. Then after that, she took the really unsettling step of actually going to college. She went to a Mennonite college, but it wasn't part of uh, the very conservative uh, group that did not believe in higher ed uh, that she was associated with. And so it was a very sort of daring move for her. But so I think that through her in particular, I got this association of reading with freedom, you know, this sense that reading opens up things that aren't available to you if you don't have the opportunity to read. And the other thing that I really owe to her in terms of reading is that when I was in kindergarten, I actually really struggled with reading because somehow the idea that letters had to be read in order didn't make much sense to me. And so my uh, kindergarten teacher was advising that I be held back and my mom actually was the one who sat me down and taught me how to read. Mm. Uh, and I think that the fact that, and, and this maybe takes us back to sociality, the fact that this was an enterprise that my mom and I did together mm. uh, and that I was able to learn from you know, the person perhaps whom I loved most in the world uh, at that time in my life also gave me a kind of intense attachment to reading. Uh, the other thing about my parents was that they believed that um, they believed that abridged novels were evil, uh, and so they were determined to make me read everything in the actual form in which it was published. So if I read War and Peace, I couldn't read a 400-page abridgment. I had to read all 1,136 pages in the Modern Library edition. Uh, so there was this sense in which I reading seemed like this exciting and liberating and freeing thing, and it also seemed like this very serious thing indeed. Every time you engaged with a book, this was something that you needed to follow through on. You'd had a kind of responsibility. And so that's why I think I became uh, so enamored of reading, because of the fact that it was both so serious and so fun and so freeing. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I, didn't have the, I didn't have the seriousness. I just want to make a, a quick comment. I similarly had, uh, was introduced to reading through my mother. She would take me to the bookmobile mm. every, oh, other, yeah. we every other week, too. right. Uh, but there was none of this kind of seriousness part to it. I was just allowed to pick out two books, oh. you know, and, and uh, whatever I wanted. And so I s remember a lot of times just going over the stacks in this, in this van, right, and just picking out these books that just caught my attention uh, and started reading that way. I was uh, inspired by Pizza Hut's Book It. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so my drive was to get pizza. But I would like to. I would like to 
ask you the next question because uh, one of the writers, philosophers that I am very inspired by is Paulo Freire. Mm. And he led um, a massive literacy movement in Brazil because at the time a person had to be literate in order to vote. So being literate, right, will allow us to go from grade to grade, but it's liberating to be able to read and write. And um, earlier you, so I mean it really is, um, it is a political act. It's not just an aesthetic one. Yeah. And earlier you were talking about the truth and how some writers, and I would like to, to give a shout out to one of my colleagues. Uh, her name is Micah Cohen Jones. We were talking, I forget what we were talking about, but, but she said, you know, one of the roles of artists is that they, unlike philosophers who are more, I guess, more upfront, right, um, artists have the ability to say the truth in ways that aren't so frontal and they can still, and I'm thinking in terms of when, when you were talking um, of Charlie Chaplin with Modern Times, right, with humor or with fiction, fictionalized characters that are still telling the truth, but in ways that will allow them to live and not be, <laughs> right, um, they, they can still be critical, but in a way that is safe. And like, I'm thinking like philosophers, for instance, Locke with his letters on, help me out, his letters for... Tolerance? Yeah, for his letters tolerance. of tolerance, thank yeah. you, you know, and Mill with freedom of speech at that time. So they were very much... Anyway, some other philosophers like Descartes write a whole preface and dedicate the book to... Yeah, well, they, it, it, in, the, in those days, they had, to, because of what they wrote, was, which was so frontal or so out front there, there so challenging, uh, they had to go into exile, <laughs> right? Yes. Similarly with Fre Freire. Yes, you know, and so, yeah, philosophers don't seem to learn to know the, the art of <laughs> Disguise telling, the, yes, or telling the truth in a different way. Well, Plato yeah. did with the myth of the cave, you mm. know. Yeah. But so my question, all of this, to say, what are your thoughts on literature and poetry and the political? So that's, uh, that's a very rich question, I think. And I think that, you know, there's some literature and poetry that really does uh, take on political questions head on, right? So I'm currently working on a book about anti-slavery poetry. Uh, and as you might imagine, anti-slavery poetry tended to be very explicitly political, right? It was about bearing witness to the atrocities of slavery and to appealing to the conscience of uh, individuals and of groups uh, as a way of bringing about change, right? So there are some areas of literature that take a very frontal sort of approach. And it was true in the 19th century, it's true today. It's also the case that there are some, there are some stories and some means of presenting things that have, uh, that have had the advantage of being able to speak to others uh, without necessarily letting the censors know, right? Letting, uh, letting people uh, who don't follow the points that are perhaps being made beneath the surface uh, see what's going on. And uh, there's where you know, Melville's attribution to Hawthorne of the desire to deceive, egregiously deceive, the superficial skimmer of pages comes into play. You know, one place where it happens for 19th century writers in particular has to do with sexuality. Um, Melville, for example, and this is true of Emily Dickinson as well, uh, they're both often read as being kind of pioneering gay writers, right? That uh, they're dealing with matters of sexuality that the 19th century, in addition to suppressing, doesn't necessarily even fully have a vocabulary to talk about. 
uh, since a lot of the language that we use around matters of sexuality dates to later in the 19th century, certainly than Melville's writing of Moby Dick or than most of Emily Dickinson's poems, uh, but really even later than the point at which uh, Melville's writing Billy Bod or just emerging at the time when he's writing Billy Bod. But you have these texts, and a lot of critics in, from the 1980s uh, on have pointed this out about Melville and Dickinson in particular, these texts that don't necessarily explicitly state what they're doing with questions of sexuality, for example, but in which uh, a reader who's prepared to see uh, what's being said is able to uh, see things that may not have been available to every reader in earlier generations. Um, and it's not without meaning, perhaps, to use a phrase that Ishmael, Melville's narrator, uses a great deal in Moby Dick, that in the first half of the 20th century, a gay writer like E.M. Forster would have found uh, Billy Budd to be of particular interest. He actually writes the libretto uh, for Benjamin Britten's operatic version of Billy Budd, right? So we've got these uh, kinds of connections that, you know, very especially in the case of figures like Melville and Dickinson, involve something of the ability to fly under the radar. Um, we also have a figure like Frederick Douglass, for example, uh, who is remembered especially for his bold confrontation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, particularly a speech like What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, where uh, he says, what is needed now is not reasoned argument, but scorching irony, right? Uh, so I think that those two tendencies both exist, right? The prophetic tendency uh, to call out what's wrong in one's world, and also the tendency to find ways in Dickinson's terms to tell the truth but tell it slant, right? Uh, to find a way to state a truth that maybe can't be stated directly at a particular time. So we covered a truth. lot of big questions, truth yes. and truth individuality <laughs> and sociality, a truth telling sexuality, politics. There's some issues that we're, are gonna have to let be left unexamined <laughs> because we're now at the end of our, our time for the dialogue. Uh, but one big one for me, because my background is in philosophy of religion, is your own interest in religion. Um, and in, in a future season, we want to have uh, some shows dedicated to philosophy and religion. And maybe, maybe we'll even bring you back then, Brian. Well, I and, would love that. <laughs> yeah, and then the other one is ethics. I mean, because we've danced around that as well, kind of the ethical sort of dimensions in literature and poetry and, and how you know, because philosophy is usually that domain where ethicists find uh, their, their, you know, heavy lifting going on. But we're at the end, okay. so <laughs> we have to draw things to a close. And I thank you for joining us and for a wonderful dialogue for, oh. and all that you've contributed to. Oh, well, thank you both so much again for the invitation. It's been such a pleasure. Yeah. And you want to do the closing? Sure. This has been Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera. My name is Kim Diaz. Jules Simon. And Dr. Brian Yothers. So um, please check out our YouTube videos and join us next time. <laughs>